Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News and welcome to 2019. Hopefully you had a great break and we're straight back into it with a really important video. Proof of Keys is happening on January 3rd. Hopefully you're watching this video before it. A lot of people are saying that you know this is going to kick off all sorts of chaos. Some people are saying it's going to be a non-event. So I want to unpack this for you, why this is so important. Not your keys, not your Bitcoin. Trace Mayer um, coined this term a number of years ago and it really is this idea of being in control of your funds, taking custody of your cryptocurrency. Don't leave it on an exchange where we hear about um, these hacks and people's accounts being frozen and all sorts of things. So it is 10 years since that Bitcoin Genesis block. Uh, that blockchain continues strongly to this day. Um, so I hope a lot of people do take this seriously because it is something that's close to my heart, which I'll talk about in just a second. Now, for a lot of people, the first step is Googling how to buy cryptocurrency. You know, our video has been watched 50 odd thousand times, but the second step of how do I store it safely you know, less than 10% of the views. And those statistics are in line with what we see when we talk to exchanges. And it's really scary the amount of cryptocurrency that people leave on these websites, on these exchanges. Very few people take the time to learn how to store it properly um, or set up a wallet. Now, we know that that didn't always end well for people, particularly back in the day. Uh, Mt. Gox at the time, you know, 70% of all Bitcoin transactions worldwide, and it puts a target on their back. And we still see exchanges get hacked, you know, to this day and in meaningful ways. So, look, this hurt me personally. I wasn't on Mt. Gox, but there was a number of smaller exchanges that got hacked as well. You don't want to know how many Bitcoins I lost back in the day and then when Bitcoin goes up, you know, a thousand fold uh, in the next couple of years, <laughs> it certainly uh, stings a little bit. Now, I'm a believer in karma and everything happens for a reason. I wouldn't have discovered Ethereum or created this channel if that hadn't have happened to me all those years ago. But I want to drive the point home that everyone thinks, oh, this won't really happen to me. Um, and then it does happen and it really does hurt, particularly if Bitcoin continues to go where we think it's going in the future. Now, back then, when I was setting up a Bitcoin wallet, it was pretty hard work. There wasn't a lot of info about public and private keys and addresses. Um, downloading the blockchain on Australian internet was taking forever and it was pretty chunky looking interface. Now that's all improved a fair bit these days so there's not a lot of excuses not to go to the official website, download the recommended wallets. You know, I've done tutorials on this sort of stuff. Our My Ether wallet tutorial is our most watched video and it's very easy to create a new wallet um, with any of the ways you want to do it. I'm going to talk about those in a second as well. Now, for other coins, this is where it gets a bit hard because people say to me, oh, what's the best wallet to store my EOS or Cardano and can I stake from there and so on? Now, a lot of these companies have little individual side projects that are working on their wallets and there's not always the one official recommended wallet. So go to their website, look in their recommended resources and recommended wallets. And the other issue is that these are so new that they're not always even out there. So you might have a coin that doesn't actually have a wallet yet. Or even some of these new ones like Cardano are still tinkering on their wallet. And I talk to these exchanges and they're saying, look, we're not even 100% confident to stake out EOS, for example, until we know these things have been out for a few months and they're 100% bug free. 99.9% .9 isn't good enough for an exchange with large amounts of um, coins that they need to store, you know, cold offline ent entirely. So look, this is all something that's pretty advanced stuff, but it's far better to understand this than to be hacked. And for a lot of people, that will be using a hardware wallet. Now, we strongly recommend Ledger and Trezor. We've got the link in the description below of every video if you want to purchase one. And they're continually adding coins. So all your ERC20 Ethereum tokens are on there, but the actual different coins with their independent blockchains, those apps need to be built out by Trezor or Ledger or you know the teams that are contributing so that we can have it 100% safe. And that's why it takes time to build these out. It's not an easy thing to do. Now, the reason that this is so important is because it's at the heart of what cryptocurrency is. Cryptocurrency came out of the GFC, the debt-based monetary system, fractional reserve lending, and a lot of people, this is what leads them down the rabbit hole. We've done our video on the top 10 economic and financial documentaries that I recommend you watch to get your head around how 
money is no longer backed by gold and all these different concepts. But these days, once you deposit money into a bank, it is no longer yours. You become a creditor legally to that bank. And we see things like uh, you know, bail-ins, haircuts, accounts being frozen, daily limits, all these different things, and it really isn't your money anymore. And Bitcoin has this concept of becoming uh, your own bank. And we're gradually getting there as a store value, medium of exchange, and all those things, the system continues to improve over time. But as you see here, most banks have a fractional reserve of around 10%. So if just 10% of people were to go in and try to withdraw their funds or spend their funds, these banks would be insolvent. Now, that is pretty scary stuff, and that is the reality of our current financial system. And a lot of people say, well, that's never going to happen. You know, bank runs a thing of the past. But the fact is, they're still happening. This is only a few years ago in Cyprus where they were going to have bail ins or haircuts on their account. So people say, well, I'll withdraw my money so that it's no longer in the bank and I won't get that haircut. And then they go to the ATM and they find out that they're closed for the day or that there's a limit or that they have a capital control as we see in China where they can't send more than a set amount in or out of the country every day. So banking really has become um, you know, suppressionary in nature rather than a service to the people. And that's why I'm so passionate about Bitcoin and, and everything that people are trying to do in the cryptocurrency space. Not only that, Bitcoin is bringing in radical transparency and accountability because of its immutable ledger. So unlike these stories we see, you know, has the government spent $21 trillion it's not telling us about? Well, taxpayers are handing over money, but we don't really know what it's being spent on. So pretty scary stuff. These are huge, huge astronomical numbers um, compared to Bitcoin where we know the circulating supply. We know the inflation rate and the block reward is going to halve every four years. And we know that there can never be more than 21 million exist. And that's not even discounting all the coins that have probably been lost forever. We can go into even more um, transparency and look at the detail on each address, the amount in there. And we know that the system isn't being cheated. And that's different to some of the headlines we've seen recently. So a headline like Bitcoin Private and a lot of other privacy coins, now they all have different mechanisms, but some of them obfuscate you know, addresses, amounts, all different aspects of the blockchain. And this can lead to something like this where it took some serious research for people to come out and find that there's actually 2 million coins um, were injected by developers. So there's 2 million extra than what people thought. Now, I'm not sure if these developers were going to dump all on market and sell it and basically try and get free money, but who's going to hold a coin where they don't know how many extra coins have been made by developers? And this is going to be um, something that's really important for those privacy coins to be able to prove that they're not just gradually printing more or the developers haven't given themselves an extra pre mine and so on. So make sure you read this story about Bitcoin Private if you haven't already. The next thing to talk about is this concept of public key, private key pairs. And that's how you generate an address or a Bitcoin wallet will do this for you. And a lot of people have never even heard or seen of this because their funds are all on an exchange where the exchange controls your wallet, your private key. So this is your Bitcoin uh, public address. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more because there's a couple of steps here. Uh, but this is your private key, which you really have to keep um, completely anonymous. So this is a demo wallet. If someone was to scan this QR code, they could import this wallet onto their phone, onto their computer, wherever they want to, because this is all you need to have access to the funds. So hopefully by now you've got your head around this concept of a public and private key pair. Um, this is just a physical example of a paper wallet, uh, but that lives on your ledger device or wherever you generate your own wallet and back that up. Um, this is what is happening in the background. Now, I want to take this a step further because this is where even people that understand the concept of public-private key pairs don't understand this next step. So that private key is what is used to generate what is known as a public key. And then from there, the public key generates your address. And more advanced users that have used wallets like Jax and Electrum will know that they can generate a new address every time for every transaction. That is the safest way 
to use Bitcoin. Now, if you lose everything, as long as you've got this private key, or often that will be, um, you know, hashed into the 12 or 24 word backup phrase. And from that, you can reboot your wallet. And that'll reboot your public keys and all your addresses. So no matter what you lose, as long as you've got that private key safe on that hardware device or your 12 words written down, you can reboot everything. So that's why this concept is so important to, to really understand, guys. Now, the safest way to create wallets can even go a step further with things like air gapping, where it's offline entirely, physically separated from the internet or the network, so there's no chance um, of hacking or people spying eyes on you. Now, if you've got a virus and then you plug it into the internet later or a key logger, yes, there's other ways that hackers can be smart. But really, if you're employing these techniques on a clean computer, it is the safest way to create a cryptocurrency wallet. Now, these sort of techniques are used by the exchanges and we can go to these websites that show us um, the richest 100 addresses and we'll see the biggest addresses are the cold wallets of Bitfinex, Binance, and so on down the list there. Now, they're stored offline entirely. So some estimates are between 90 and 95% of coins live offline. So yes, that's very good for security, but it also means that if everyone tries to pull their coins out at once, there's going to be a little bit of a wait. So they're going to have to do this step by step, nice and safe. Who knows if these are kept at separate locations in bank vaults or whatever it is. They only keep enough on hand on their hot wallets for daily transactions and average volumes and so on. So look, this is a sort of thing where it might lead to a bit of panic, but I'm not sure that a lot of people even care about that. And you know, that sucks to say. Um, I definitely encourage you to not be in that group of people and to take control of your own uh, custody. Buy a hardware wallet if you haven't already, guys. We've got the link in the description below. But I think this is something that's really important to do. Not only for having custody of your, your private keys for storing, but for using your cryptocurrency. So a lot of people decide, I want to sell my cryptocurrency and then get told that they've got a limit or they want to send it to another website and then it'll say, well, where did you get your initial funds for? Um, why are you sending it to that website? What are you using it for? And there's a million questions. So people all of a sudden have the realization that, hey, this isn't really my coins, just like it isn't really your money uh, in the bank. You know, At least hopefully, most of these exchanges aren't running factional reserves like banks. But the idea is that we find out which ones might be. So personally, I don't think it's going to be any of the big exchanges. But just before I started recording this, the headline comes out that HitBTC has frozen customers' accounts ahead of this proof of coins event. So look, I don't know if this story's just been a little bit attention grabbing. I don't know if HitBTC are running fractional reserves, but this is where a bit of panic and FUD can set in and expect the mainstream media to push out these articles and really try and scare people. So be aware that this may happen. Be aware of the headlines. Hopefully, if you've been watching our videos, you have custody of your Bitcoin and cryptocurrency already and you have a hardware wallet. So I hope you've enjoyed that video, guys, and understand the importance of proof of keys. Smash that like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. Share these videos around. And thanks for tuning in, guys. Cheers.